Yes, good day, everyone. My name is John Nielsen. I am not a herring specialist, although I've uh, studied fisheries in all three coasts of Canada over a career which uh, spans quite a few decades. And I have tried to get as much information as I can on Pacific herring and uh, become reasonably familiar with this. And I want to share some of the information I've learned about this fascinating species with you today. The major parts of my presentation are what is special about the biology of herring and how does that affect management, the importance of the waters around Hornby and Denman Island for herring, the current status of herring in the Strait of Georgia Salish Sea, and then finally turning to the future, how can we help the Salish Sea herring population thrive? My first consideration from a biological perspective is uh, herring is a, manage, uh, a forage species and really is on the menu for many predators. And DFO has highlighted the importance of, of um, herring for predators such as lingcod and chinook salmon. You can see here in this graphic, it really comprises a, a big fraction of the overall diet for those predators. But this is kind of an incomplete representation. And if you spent any time in the waters around uh, Hornby Island, you would see sites like this, the California sea lion male, I think, uh, chowing down on herring and uh, Glaucus wing gulls, um, harlequin ducks and great blue herons, bald eagles and otters among the cast of characters that are really enjoying a feed of herring during the months of March. And these images, by the way, are courtesy of uh, supporters of Conservancy Horn Beyond. Thank you for allowing me to use these images. And uh, the last image is courtesy of Rainforest Alliance. And here we have a black bear chowing down on some herring spawn on a beach in the central coast of uh, Vancouver Island. So overall, you can see that the uh, the scenes around Hornby Island in particular form a marine Serengeti wilderness experience, which really is not an exaggeration, as you can see. If you have the opportunity to see it, go and see it. It's really something to see. Take my word for it. So turning again to the critical aspects of biology for management, Herring are repeat spawners. They are not like salmon, where it's one spawning and, and that's it. If you happen to be around Hornby Island in the month of March, you might be fortunate enough to see this site where you'd rub your eyes and think you are on a tropical island as the water turns this lovely turquoise color. Um, uh, so herring are repeat spawner and um, uh, the, the uh, uh, herring release melt into the water in a sort of broadcast way. So this results in the water changing color. And they first spawn when they're three years old, then annually. And the eggs themselves are sticky and they often uh, attach themselves to uh, vegetation like this and forming several layers thick. On occasion, if it's particularly stormy, this vegetation will end up in windrows along the uh, the edge of the beach, and in which case the eggs may dry out and uh, suffer quite a bit of loss. Another aspect of the biology of herring for management is that the populations fluctuate greatly. And from this paper by Essington et al., they showed uh, examples of herring populations from around the world. And you can see the sorts of fluctuations from one year to the next, which sometimes are quite extreme. Look at the example in the uh, second from the bottom, and that's Queen Charlotte's herring. And you can see the nature of the variation. And some influential scientists have stated that the usual management approaches which we use do not fully account for these large natural fluctuations or indeed the role that these forage fish play in marine ecosystems. And we'll return to this uh, uh, theme later in the talk. 
So how do we know where they spawn and the importance of local waters for the resource? DFO conducts intensive and extensive scuba sampling for herring throughout the Salish Sea. These surveys have been ongoing since 1951, but unfortunately there was a significant methodological shift in 1988. And the information is available on three geographic scales uh, shown below. On the right hand side, you can see the most general uh, uh, low level of resolution showing the whole Salish Sea. Uh, middle panel, we start to home in in the waters around Hornby and Denman Island. And finally, we're looking at the locations, particular locations around the Comox Peninsula in the north and then the two islands there. If we look at each location, and here's a couple of examples off of uh, Denman Island, um, there are established transects which uh, are swum by divers every year to the extent that's possible. And this is off an area called the Comas Bluff. Those red lines signify the, uh, uh, the lines as swum, as swum by the divers. <clears throat> We can see that uh, from the information DFO has gathered over the years um, that these local waters are really important for the production of herring. Um, as a result of a question asked by Conservancy Hornby Island, I put together DFO data from 1988 to 2019. And I went through an exercise of basically ranking the importance of the 147 unique locations throughout the Strait of Georgia and I simply calculated the average rank importance. Now this table on the right shows the results and location names are leftmost column and the rank is shown in the middle. These are the 20 most important locations in the whole uh, Strait of Georgia. The ones which are uh, geographic areas around uh, Hornby and Denman Islands are highlighted and you can see how important uh, the local waters are for the production of, of herring. You can also see how persistent several sites are from year to year. I took some of the, the three most significant sites, Collishaw Point, Phil and Glay Park and Coma, Comas Bluff and calculated the rank from year to year over time. And you can see that uh, the highly ranked uh, spots don't change much from year to year. Uh, so this is, signifies that the fish in general are returning to a particular area and spawning there. And this was particularly true early in the series. And I'll return to the, the significance of those observations uh, later. Next, I'll discuss how DFO measures abundance. Most fishery assessments rely on an index of abundance, and some relationship is assumed or demonstrated between this index of abundance and the actual or true population abundance. These indices can either be fishery dependent or fishery independent, such as from a, a survey. If we have information which is fishery independent, generally speaking, that's considered to be preferred. So in the case of Pacific carrying, the index of abundance is indeed that uh, survey of the spawn I spoke to earlier. These indices are available for five geographic areas. So we have the Strait of Georgia, the Central Coast, Prince Rupert District, Haida Gwaii, and the west coast of Vancouver Island. There are a couple of smaller regions and taken together, DFO thinks they've captured the main stock components for, for herring. But I will note there is controversy on this as I've heard from some of the email discussions around Pacific Caring. Now looking at some of the trends in the, uh, in the index of spawning, uh, if we recall how DFO breaks down the spawn index, 
There are two sub areas that are close to Comox Valley. One is lumped together as sub area 14, which includes Denman and Hornby, and that's the purple shading in the middle of the figure. And another of importance is, is Lazo, north of Cape Lazo, the green shading. <clears throat> The overall trend in the abundance index is shown on the right. And as I pointed out, the methodology changed in 1988 and is indicated by the vertical red line. Overall, you can see that the index is following an increasing trend since that point. The lower panel shows the percent contribution to the above index by area. Note the importance of the 14 and 17 group. Uh, now that, as you recall, is Hornby and Denman Island, shown in the purple color. And notice how purple dominates that plot. And the Lazo group is the blue component. Also important to note is the the absence of the southernmost area, yellow, in later years. So you see yellow being quite important uh, early in the time series, but diminishing. So that southern component has dropped off. And also uh, the eastern strait of Georgia, the blue component is less important. Um, <clears throat> I misspoke earlier, the lasso group is green. So we see some changes over time. But overall, the Hornby and Denman component is, is really very, very dominant. So speaking now to the stock assessment process for Pacific carrying, uh, Fisheries and Oceans takes catch data from the various fisheries. Um, you can see the spawn on uh, bow fisheries shown there on the bottom left. Um, the same fishery in the middle and the gillnet fishery in the bottom right. And so it gets tonnages, the numbers caught at age, and the abundance index, and integrates those all together to develop the model of abundance. The assessment then provides estimates of biomass at the beginning of each calendar year, and decisions can be made on the fishing and how much to take out of the water. So here's the bottom line from the stock assessment that was completed and published in January 2021. So this is really hot off the press. The trend in spawning stock biomass is indicated by the, the solid black line. And the confidence we have around that solid black line is shown by the gray shading. Uh, so notice how imprecise also that the estimate of biomass is in the final year of the stock assessment, the beginning of the year 2021. So this is not unusual, but actually the overlap and the sort of confidence in that estimate places it right into that pinkish zone surrounding the red line. The red line, if you recall from Bob Rangeley, Dr. Rangeley's talk earlier, indicates the limit reference point so there's the estimate of the limit reference point. And so with that kind of imprecision, uh, the stock could be in a poor position. Commercial catch is shown as color, colored bars and the legend is on the bottom. So you have the various gear types reflected by uh, uh, the colors with the row fishery shown in green and uh, the gill, gillnet fishery, that is, and the row seine fishery, shown as a yellow color. <coughs> Excuse me. So interpreting the stock assessment results, context is important. Um, I have heard reports on the media that uh, the herring row fishery industry has, has said that biomass has increased. And indeed, if you look at the years the uh, spokesperson referred to, which was 2010 to 2020, they are indeed correct, depending on the starting year. 
However, if you choose a different point of reference that you can see the stock is down compared with the 1990s, for example. So my point here is that clarity and care is needed to avoid making misleading statements. Uh, so I think this is very important when you consider the status of any fishery resource. Now the audience will have seen this same slide in Bob Rangeley's talk. And just in the case of Pacific Caring, we know the target exploitation rate for the fishery has been 20%, and that was set regardless of biomass and stock status. DFO is moving towards an approach which better reflects the status of the resource. So if it is in that cautious zone, the rate of exploitation is meant to ramp down depending on if the stock is in a somewhat better or somewhat worse situation. It could even, as he crosses that limit reference point, it could be that the fishery could be as little as conceivably could be or shut down completely. Uh, so those are the range of options which are uh, available using the precautionary approach and DFO uh, according to the management plan and the stock assessment documents which I've read is committed to developing and more fully implementing this. They have defined the limit reference point uh, but they need now to move on to define the upper stock reference point so we know the boundary between healthy and critical and here's where uh, the public can weigh in and there's an opportunity to do so uh, at the same time next year or, or slightly before then. So apart from the stock assessment, there are reasons to be cautious with the Salish Sea herring fishery. There are depleted components elsewhere in BC waters, and I'll give examples of that. Species that rely on herring, either directly or indirectly, are in some trouble. We can document that. Environmental stress associated with climate change. We don't have a clear idea about how that's going to play out, but we are concerned. And lastly, the spatial concentration of spawners. I spoke of this, and uh, I'll speak to why I have a particular concern in that regard as well. Turning to the depleted stocks, state of the other major stocks of Pacific Caring, this is from the uh, last year's stock assessment. Those are the fair, four groups which I showed in that earlier figure. And you can see for all four of them, they are quite close to that limit reference point. And indeed, in the case of Haidekwai, it was uh, slightly below the limit reference point. So the extent of fisheries, as shown by the bars, has really not been much for some time and they haven't yet recovered. So these are uh, components which are quite depleted compared to their previous uh, history. Other components of the Salish Sea ecosystem are, are in some difficulty. Um, I have been involved with the assessment of Chinook salmon for the organization which deals with the status of endangered wildlife in Canada, COSIWIG. And there are 28 populations of Chinook salmon in southern British Columbia. And Kosiwig recently assessed all of them. And here's the scorecard relative to their ranking. 12 of the 28 were assessed at the highest level of risk. And only two of the 28 were considered not at risk. So we can see that uh, there is a strong case to be made that uh, Chinook salmon uh, are in difficulty and need special protection. Looking at other components of the Salish Sea ecosystem, what about seabirds? Um, I am certainly not a seabird biologist, but I was quite impressed by a paper, a uh, recent paper by Athie et al. 2020, that pulled together 20 years of uh, citizen science observations and compared the status of groups of 
seabirds on the Sa in the Salish Sea compared to those counterpart populations on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And you can see it in the graphic on the bottom right. The Salish Sea groups are those which are orange, whereas those on the west coast of Vancouver Island are those which are yellow. And along the bottom axis, you can see the status of those groups on the left hand side decreasing uh, near that dashed horizontal line that's considered stable, then actually increasing. So you can see the west coast of Vancouver Island groups tend to be in a better place relative to the Salish Sea component. Considering another component, a sort of iconic component of our Salish Sea ecosystem, there's the southern resident killer whales, which are much in the news. Historically, it is thought the population was about 200 animals, now down to 72, although we've heard some good news in terms of a birth or two recently, I believe. There is concern over the nutrition and condition of the remaining animals and ultimately the population, the ability of the population to rebuild. I must say that while a direct relationship between herring abundance and that of southern resident killer whales has not been established to my knowledge, it does seem precautionary uh, to manage herring as though there is a direct relationship and it seems common sense. Environmental stress associated with climate change. This is another, another aspect which is not very well understood at this point, but there is a, a recent paper from UBC that indicated that climate shifts could strongly reduce the biomass and resilience of herring and its predators. And we know from the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that as the Strait of Georgia herring are faced with increasing temperature and acidity, changes in prey fields, and competition from other species. The implications of this are all unknown, but could very well be negative. I already spoke about uh, spawners being increasingly concentrated, and you can see that some small spawning components are being lost, or have already been lost, or at least some could argue that as, as we see this shift in the distribution, we've lost components. And could this represent the loss of important biodiversity that could help the stock sustain pressures such as climate change? We don't know, but it is a, a real possibility and one which we must uh, be concerned with. <clears throat> So given those concerns, what are constructive options for future management? In my view, we need to support the precautionary approach and ask decision makers and politicians to implement conservative harvest plans that respects the best information on the abundance and stock structure of Pacific herring. Also, there is evidence that herring have preferred areas for spawning that have persisted over time. Ask policymakers to consider marine protected area in waters near Hornby and Denman Island that protect locations identified as important for spawning. MPAs have been recognized as a kind of insurance policy against unforeseen future events. Thanks a lot for listening.